Thank you everyone for joining us. It's a delight to have all of you here. Uh, my name is David Murphy and I am uh, just delighted uh, to have all of you joining us in the TechFire community here. Uh, a huge thank you to Victoria uh, for joining us here, our, our speaker. A huge thank you to Patrick Anding uh, from DLA Piper and to the firm uh, for sponsoring today. Uh, it's just wonderful to uh, be able to, uh, you know, gather together uh, online here. I know we were all uh, originally hoping to be together for our summit uh, in person. Of course, it's been uh, such a crazy year. I hope uh, all of you are, uh, you know, uh, not just surviving, but thriving. Uh, and uh, definitely uh, send out uh, best wishes. I know I want to be together all the more uh, with everyone in, in hard times here, but at least we can gather virtually. And I uh, just want to uh, thank uh, DLA Piper uh, for their flexibility. Uh, uh, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Elizabeth Anderson, uh, to the whole team uh, uh, in uh, in moving things online here. We're excited to, to work with the firm on a series of additional events as well here. And uh, and huge thanks, uh, you know, to, to you, Victoria. Uh, uh, for those of you who, who may have Missed the email that went out yesterday. Uh, we we um, found ourselves in a bit of a scramble with our uh, original speaker having a unexpected uh, conflict just coming up here 24 hours before the event, and and uh, Victoria just heroically stepped in to, to join us on you know literally 24 hours notice, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, just huge compliments uh, to you and and your colleagues uh, at the firm. I mean, you really see uh, you know uh, what what folks are like under uh, under pressure and duress and uh, and the whole uh, the whole team at police has just jumped into action uh, you know to, to to respond here when I sent out a, an, an email to everyone so uh, uh, you're heroic and it really speaks well to, to the firm so uh, anyway uh, uh, without Thank any further ado uh, just um, just want to uh, again um, thank uh, everyone who's logging in here I see the, the numbers Coming in, uh, it's great to have you uh, all joining us. If you're just joining us, and uh, and uh, you know, uh, curious, uh, uh, you know, how many folks are are joining us for the first time? I know I saw a lot of new names on our RCP list. We're particularly delighted to have folks joining us from around the world, uh, uh, from the DLA Piper community, uh, uh, both partners and, and clients, and uh, it's wonderful to have all of you. And that's one of the wonderful things, uh, of course, uh, uh, being online here. We uh, uh, started TechFire back in 2013 in the Los Angeles area and have done more than 50 events uh, with Patrick actually being uh, one of our most frequent moderators uh, over the years. Uh, and we've had a lot of fun. We, you know, we, we love gathering in person, but uh, we expanded to the Bay Area last uh, year. And, uh, and now it's wonderful to be able to serve folks uh, from uh, far beyond as well uh, you know, uh, through Zoom here. So thank you all for joining us. And if you aren't familiar with TechFire, uh, really, uh, these fireside chats are the core of what we love to do. Uh, they're a uh, uh, format we've done more than any other event across our 50 events. We, we just love the chance to have an in-depth uh, conversation to really get to know uh, uh, top venture capitalists uh, from uh, Silicon Valley and beyond. And, and uh, I think right now, uh, given uh, you know how much things are shifting week to week, uh, it's more important than ever that uh, entrepreneurs and, and everyone uh, in the ecosystem learn uh, just how things are really happening, <laughs> how deals are really happening, uh, you know, uh, uh, not just, uh, you know, hear from uh, news reports. So uh, we're looking forward to a great conversation today. And, and uh, you know, I just want to uh, give for those of you who, who are not familiar with DLA Piper, quick overview about the firm, uh, since they are, are so wonderful to be uh, supporting this event as presenting sponsor. They are, of course, uh, one of the, the world's preeminent and largest uh, law firms. And if you're a founder, uh, if you're an entrepreneur like me, I just want to urge you, uh, you know, if you're just starting out, uh, it's really tempting, I know, uh, if you're in ramen noodle mode to, to go with your uncle's brother's, you know, uh, best friend, you know, who's an attorney, a divorce attorney, and have them put together your founding documents. I have seen stories uh, where this just comes crumbling down. I mean, uh, it's a disaster. You know, you think it's so hard to build a startup. Uh, you have to build it now more than ever on strong foundations. And 
when you you know bring on a, a firm like DLA Piper, uh, not only are you getting, of course, the world's best legal advice, but you're also tapping into uh, their global network. And uh, you know, uh, if you're from LA uh, like me, and you you know you're up in Silicon Valley, uh, if you're driving to Palo Alto, you see the DLA Piper you know logo right there as you're you're coming into town. I mean, they have a huge presence, uh, of course, in, in in the valley and and here in, in LA and Southern California uh, and around the world. So. Uh, their network, of course, forget the locations, uh, is what it's all about, though. So, um, you know, I do uh, urge uh, everyone who who is uh, a founder uh, like me to uh, to really think long and hard about uh, the importance of, of bringing on the right legal advisor. And uh, I just don't want to see, you know, uh, folks suffer as, uh, you know, I've seen folks do when, when, when they don't choose the right, <laughs> the right advisor. So, um, they, they, in particular, have some great programs uh, within their emerging growth venture capital group. Uh, there's a program called DLA Piper Accelerate, uh, which is their online resource uh, for entrepreneurs who are looking to start the next big thing. Uh, so definitely check that out. It's, again, called Accelerate. And you can also reach out to, to Patrick Danning directly, patrick.danning at DLAPiper.com uh, if you want to follow up after the event. So uh, uh, just uh, a little bit more about Patrick's background first. Uh, Patrick, uh, as I said, um, uh, you know, uh, we're really grateful to you for, for being one of our most frequent and, and best moderators of the years. But he does have a day job besides being a, a tech fire moderator. Um, <laughs> Patrick is a partner with DLA Piper, who, uh, whose expertise spans, uh, you know, serving uh, startups and venture capital uh, firms. Uh, he's worked with uh, over his career. Uh, some of the big names in the industry, uh, NEA, Kleiner Perkins, Anthem, Innovation Endeavors, and, and others, and of course, supported startups through many deals uh, with VC uh, uh, firms uh, across uh, across Silicon Valley and beyond. And his background also spans the entertainment industry as well. He had uh, uh, been with uh, DreamWorks, Disney, Mattel, BBC, the Getty Museum, and beyond. Uh, so uh, really, uh, uh, you know, I, I know as we look at uh, Southern California's uh, strengths, obviously, uh, entertainment uh, side of the tech ecosystem is a fascinating one. And looking forward to planning some more events with Patrick uh, uh, in the coming months and two here, uh, may even explore uh, the entertainment side uh, in our next event. We'll have to chat more about that. But um, I'm so grateful to you, Patrick, for, for joining us today to moderate. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to you shortly, but uh, let me just introduce uh, Victoria. Uh, for those of you who, uh, you know, uh, follow the things, you'll know, obviously, uh, you know, all about her and all about Lisa already. But uh, if you're if you're just uh, starting out in the, in the industry, she is the general partner and managing director. Uh, and it's delicious. And they are, you know, a firm that just uh, very smartly, I think, uh, timed it very well. So it's their latest fund, uh, just as the pandemic was starting, <laughs> very good timing. But, uh, you know, even if they were out still raising it, I'm sure they would have had total success because they've really had, uh, as TechCrunch noted in their story, you know, a, a string of, of big hits. Uh, portfolio companies include Ring, Cruise, Switch, Dollar Shave Club, Michael Dubin's a past speaker of ours, uh, you know, Dropcam, uh, so many others. And they've had so many exits to uh, Google's, Apple's, Microsoft's, the world amongst their portfolio. So, so it's a really cool firm uh, that, that, you know, uh, as I said, uh, we saw, you know, on the inside how responsive and helpful they are. Uh, and uh, Victoria joined them with uh, a great deal of, of operator experience. Uh, she had been uh, Chief Revenue Officer of Cabbage, uh, had been uh, Chief Marketing Officer, I believe, for North America with Travelocity, and had a range of leadership roles with Ring Central, American Express, Amazon, you name it. So, uh, Victoria, we're so grateful to have you joining us uh, again. You are just heroic uh, to make this happen <laughs> on 24 hours notice. And I'm going to turn things over without any further ado to, to you and to Patrick uh, for the conversation. And I just want to invite everyone in the audience to start submitting questions. We're going to have a, a, an audience Q&A um, at the end. Uh, so there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Click that, and then you can upvote uh, other people's questions as well. We can see the best rise at the top. You can also post questions in the chat, too, and network there as we go along. And uh, I'll moderate everything as we go along, but it's best to put them in the Q&A uh, tool there if you can, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. So, Patrick, I know you have some great questions uh, yourself. I'll let you take over. Thanks, David. 
Yeah, thanks, David, for all the kind words and uh, always happy to be here and to participate in events like this. I love the startup community, love the community in LA and uh, love to talk to folks who help um, inspire and, and f finance these businesses and these innovators and entrepreneurs, many of which are, are participating and on this uh, Zoom today. Um, so Victoria, I, I think what I would like to do, um, our time is limited, so I want to get into some very like granular, meaty questions, but just to start, I think it would be um, great for the people uh, who don't know a lot about uh, Felicis Ventures, uh, for you to give just a few minutes of background about your role at Felicis, what Felicis does, and what the kind of general thesis is. Sure. So uh, Felicis is an earlier stage venture firm. We invest in seed through the stages, and we are multi-sector. Some of our largest focus areas are health, health technology, security, enterprise SaaS, FinTech, SMB, and consumer. We have over our time in venture, the firm started initially as an angel fund uh, in uh, 2008 and then became um, an institutional VC fund. Uh, we're now in our seventh fund, which we um, announced at the beginning of March. But one of the core aspects of the firm is flexibility uh, and diversification across sectors. So um, those, those are kind of the, the big picture buckets, but we, we also spend a lot of time identifying core growth sectors uh, and moving into them. And then the, the firm is really built around founders and entrepreneurs. We have a range of programs that are um, unbelievably focused on founders and, and founder empathy. And they start with something called the Founders Pledge, where we commit 1% of our uh, fees toward um, investing for the companies that we invest in, in supporting our founders through um, their journey uh, in mental health. And so that mental health support, we can talk about this, I'm sure, uh, during the panel, but it's come, it's become incredibly important through COVID, but we actually launched this pledge in 2018 and it goes towards supporting founders in leadership coaching, therapy, CEO circles, basically everything they need to get their dream team around them and help them through um, the, some of the lows and the challenges of, of building a business. And so that's a big part of, of what we do at Felicis that's, that's unique. We also commit to voting our shares with the founders um, and have our, the firm is really built on a core foundation of, of founder empathy. So um, all, uh, all of our partners have deep operating experience. We spend a lot of time diving in and helping our founders in, in introductions and helping them reach that next, um, that, that helping them get that introduction that moves their, their company forward uh, on the next plane, uh, whether it's distribution or it's key, um, key hires, but that's, that's what really uh, makes, makes us tick on the investor side is when we're able to uh, be partners and, and help move the business forward. We've, we've invested in about 300 companies. Um, we've had uh, 80 exits, about 30 companies um, valued uh, over a billion dollars, uh, uh, unicorns with the most recent exits um, uh, that have been announced are Credit Karma, uh, which was sold to Intuit, uh, Plaid, um, Emailage, uh, and so we, we across, across, but it, the, the exits are across all the sectors. That's really interesting. So I guess from your perspective, um, and my next question was really about your transition from working as an operator to a VC. So you were the chief revenue officer of Cabbage. Um, yeah. And then, and then it was just a few years ago, you moved over to the venture capital mm -hmm. side. Yeah. So I, I was curious to know, and I think this ties into some of the things you just described. Um, I guess one, how your perspective changed from being on the operator side to the daily struggles of a startup and raising money and managing burn rate to, uh, and probably to, to, as a chief revenue officer, reporting to VCs and your investors uh, mm -hmm. to give them confidence in your business and how your perspective changes when you become a VC and you're on the other side of the table. Um, and then it sounds like you, your whole kind of model is based around that empathetic kind of understanding. Yeah. 
of what 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 the VC, what the entrepreneurs are going through. Yeah, look, I mean, I think that as the when you when you are in the VC chair versus the operator chair, one of the ways that you could help your companies is that you are looking not just at their industry and their company, but you're able to scan, you know, you're scanning the landscape constantly in terms of what's what work, what's working, what's not working across different sectors, across different stages. You recognize the patterns and then you can bring those patterns to help your companies. And I don't think you have that perspective as an operator. By the way, for the record, I loved both. Um, and still love both, both operating and being an investor. But that pattern recognition and also the landscape where you can really, really connect the dots. You know, you know that your company needs a uh, distribution relationship to really expand and change their go-to-market landscape. And you're meeting with different companies and Fortune 500 CEOs, you're in a much better position to be able to make that connection. And so that those are some of the values that I, I see as being different on the, on the VC side. At the same time, when you're sitting across Zoom uh, or across the table with, and you're meeting with companies, I think it's incredibly helpful to form a bond with the founder when you talk about, for example, how do you build inside sales from the ground up? Is it best to start with your customer service reps and test, in, test with them? Or does that bias the results? And should you instead start with and go out and hire a couple of salespeople and test with them? Because by the way, customer service mindset, very different than sales mindset. And so I really appreciate, and I think founders do as well, being a bring to bear those experiences from building and scaling multiple companies uh, that, that hopefully are helpful to them. I think it, it builds a, a, a connection and um, helps the conversations move forward quickly. Yeah, I think that's, that's th those are great points. I, I often find my discussions with founders because I work with startups um, who are often raising money we're trying to analyze who to work with in terms of directors or advisors or investors. And I think some of the things you just described uh, that you obviously have, which is domain expertise and certain aspects of the business, those types of things are what startups should hone in on and the partners they, they, they bring into their business, finding ways to find value add. Um, one of the things you said a few minutes ago um, in your kind of introduction, I, I want to uh, circle back to you and that's the, the issue of mental health. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a really interesting yeah. Uh, a discussion point topically um, in this environment, um, obviously with uh, the kind of pandemic and the lockdown and then some of the kind of emotional, personal, social stresses on top of what I'd say are the economic and business stresses that founders are going through. I, you know, I've got lots of companies that are um, both stressed personally and then quite stressed on the business side. Um, and I'm curious to know from your experience, uh, either, you know, pre-pandemic and during pandemic, like how, how you're working with founders, if there are yep. lessons or tips um, or thoughts you would share with people on, even on this call about uh, things that they can do uh, to, to help uh, themselves and their businesses. You know, I think mental health is one of the most important areas to zoom in on as part of the pandemic. And it's both in terms of founders and all of mental health for all of us. And I'll share some of the insights there. And then on the company formation side and the investing side, it, I think it also remains one of the largest investing opportunities. It already was hot, and I think it, it will continue to, to grow in terms of what we see in company formation. You know, on the mental health side, we um, do a lot of research around founder health. And even before the pandemic, we, we found that um, founders, about 30%, have reported dealing with depression. This is pre, pre COVID. Um, and about 50% uh, report at some point um, suffering from burnout. And then when the pandemic hit, we found that it, it, across the board, it triggered immense stress for founders um, almost you know, overnight. 
Um, some saw their fundraising prospects evaporate um, almost overnight. Um, others had significant challenges at home as parents or as single people who are quarantined at, at home. And then of course there's you know, your team. How do you quickly, very quickly adjust to be a leader to your team who's never seen anything like this? And all of a sudden leadership becomes more important than ever, right? Leadership is really tested during a crisis. And so you as the CEO, you actually, you have to take care of yourself first as, and the founder to make sure that you're in a good place. We, we say, make sure that you, like the airplane, that you put your oxygen mask on first, because if you're exhausted and you're spent, the, the team, you know, as a leader, it's, it's, a, it's incredible to, to see how much the team picks up everything about you, with, you know, whether you look tired, whether you look stressed, and so you, your mental state and well-being is super, super important. So what we did, um, given how critical mental health is to Felicis, is we, we organized ourselves um, right away to start helping the founders. We set up um, sort of three phases. So we first started um, in the month, first month of, of the pandemic with holding open Zooms for our founders where they could drop in this, this we started March 15th through April 15th and uh, literally ask any support questions. And you know, some of the questions were things like um, platforms or were the, you know, what were the best platforms or tools that people were using for remote work to um, of course runway, uh, what is the runway that, that that company should plan for to how do you keep your employees motivated? Um, what what perks should we offer for larger companies to help people through the remote time? So that was kind of phase one. Then phase two, we moved into scenario planning where we helped founders actually plan ahead for the next two years. So we definitely believe that, um, and I believe the, the pandemic and COVID is not a 2020 event. It, I think it will continue through 2021 uh, in some form before people are, uh, vaccine is widely available. And so the, the best advice uh, that, that I have for founders is this, is, this is the new normal, get like move through the shock and, and plan for this being the new normal for the next one to two years. And so there we worked with uh, our founders on scenario planning on how do you expand runway uh, to two years, our recommendations, two years of runway. How do you build the path to profitability in some cases? Um, where, you know, where do you need to adjust your business model? Obviously, some business models uh, did phenomenally well during COVID and boomed and, and others mm -hmm. needed to make some adjustments. So those were kind of the, the three phases that, that we walked through with our founders. And then the last one I think is really important from a mental health standpoint is to be uh, very intentional with the messages that you send to your team. Your team is looking for you for, for, for guidance and leadership more than ever. So be really specific in things like um, kids and pets are welcome when they drop in on Zoom calls. So people don't feel that, you know, the parents in the room, they, they don't feel that stress of, well, what happens if, if my kid comes in and starts playing video games while I'm on a Zoom call? You just want to do everything to try to relieve stress for your team of this new environment. So we thought that was most helpful. And then of course, because we have the pledge, um, we made sure that our founders were working with um, a leadership coach, a therapist, whatever they needed. It was super, super important to have that curated support network around you uh, to, to work through these times. Are you finding other uh, firms, uh, VC firms in the market are doing similar things? Are you, are you working and having conversations with other partners about approaches like this? Um, so we don't, we don't know of another firm that um, has launched the 1% mental health pledge. As far um, as I know, we are the only ones to have done that. We, we receive a lot of compliments around that. So that's, that's, it's, um, 
I'm happy to see that. But I, I we have seen firms um, step in and help uh, encourage their founders uh, with things like YPO groups or 10X and CEO circles um, absolutely are super helpful. It's maybe a little bit less, uh, uh, more informal than, than Felices, which is a, a very uh, deliberate and specific program, uh, but absolutely seeing um, other firms recommend th that type of support as well. Mm, that's really interesting. So picking up on a theme you just talked about, um, kind of roadmap planning and this two year kind of runway recommendation you know, I, I uh, often talk uh, about road, roadmaps and fundraising plans with early stage uh, companies. And my typical advice is if you go to raise money, it's going to take you six months to a year, kind of mm -hmm. plan for that. And then, you know, your runway when you raise money should be about two years. Um, eight weeks ago, I think the, the sentiment was that the VC markets had shut down, essentially, especially for mm -hmm. any sort of new investments. It was mostly going to uh, look like follow on investments and rescue money for current portfolio companies. Um, I, I'm kind of curious to know, I feel like the, the market has shifted a little bit in the past eight weeks. It's not quite as apocalyptic as it was um, in, in March. Um, so I'm kind of curious to know what, what, what you're, you're planning to do, what your thoughts are, what, and maybe what you think the market generally will look like through the end of the year. Sure, sure. I'll give you, I'll give you my thoughts on it. Uh, so, so many thoughts here. The first one is, um, we have seen uh, significant divergence in sectors where certain sectors are very much in favor and others are not. Um, I, I happen to be a huge Warren Buffett fan. Last year, I went for the first time to the, I physically went to hit the meeting in April oh, wow. <laughs> in, in Omaha. Um, experience and everyone should have at some point if they love Buffett. And so this year, obviously I couldn't go but I went through the transcript and listened to parts of it. And as we all know, you know, Buffett is so pro-America and so long, mm -hmm. long stocks. And I think he had a, an incredibly interesting quote that he, uh, for coming out of this year's annual meeting, he said something like, yes, yes, I, I still believe you should bet on America, but you better be careful where and how you bet. Um, which I think really speaks to the fact that there's been this incredible divergence. You see it obviously in the public market and you see some of that as well in the venture markets in terms of the hot sectors right now. So um, he, the, you know, the sectors that we see as doing particularly well are infrastructure, security, health tech, um, e-commerce infrastructure. I, I mean, infrastructure has absolutely gone through the roof. If you, if you look mm -hmm. at the public stocks of Okta, Datadog, Microsoft, right? The story is very clear. And I- Yeah, so digital infrastructure. Like, yeah. yeah, cloud infrastructure, cloud, absolutely, yeah. right? So cloud native companies. Um, and I would say that I see the same thing in the venture market. There, I, I would say infrastructure, not only has not slowed down, but is hotter than ever um, in terms of deal activity. So if you look at a, a deal activity, um, the data obviously is not out yet for Q2 uh, 20, 2020. Q1 data showed some of these patterns. So kind of the, the big picture that you see for deal activity, and this is from PwC, is um, infrastructure at the top of the list of, of deals getting done, um, a, de a significant drop in seed deals, which we should talk about because I, I hope to see some, some, some comeback there. Um, I was just looking at the report, so I'll share um, a couple, couple of those data points on um, mm -hmm. the, big, the big sectors that did, uh, that did the best, but it was uh, basically um, core, you know, core infrastructure, large deals, internet, um, healthcare, SaaS, um, and then areas that did not do as well was uh, basically everything in consumer. Um, consumer has really suffered. Um, we saw consumer really start to drop last year. And I would say that that, that trend um, has continued through, through COVID. Now, 
um, you know, I think that COVID is driving some fundamental behavior changes in mm -hmm. uh, how consumers shop, what they care about in their values. And so uh, I, my personal prediction is in the next one to two years, we will see a resurgence of new consumer models um, across across different areas of consumer. But right now, um, the consumer uh, consumer businesses are having um, a much harder time getting getting funded. Um, same with SMB sector uh, as well, uh, and then mm -hmm. and then seed deals. Seed activity was the biggest drop off. Right, um, you see seed investors sort of sitting on the sidelines and not, not going to VCs, potentially um, staying and uh, you know, maybe waiting and saving more money in their current job before they go raise capital um, and sort of bootstrapping longer. So I'll be really curious to see what happens to, to seed activity for the second half of the year. My, um, my personal prediction is that it will pick back up. Yeah, probably in some sector specific kind yeah. of formulation that you're describing. So, you know, a tenet of Warren Buffett's, I think, is always to invest in what you know. Yes. Um, that's kind of one of his primary kind of principles. So you have uh, quite a lot of experience uh, and interest and expertise in fintech. Yeah. Um, so, so, so maybe we could turn the conversation towards that. Uh, sure. And then playing off the, this last kind of discussion, um, I'm curious to, I guess, hear your thoughts about the, the fintech as a as a sector, both um, with the existing you know businesses, and then what you think the opportunities are for that, um, both kind of in light of COVID and you know maybe just generally. Yeah, I think um, I think in in fintech. Uh, so first of all, both across enterprise and consumer fintech, the the recessions, the last two recessions have sort of fun, massive fintech companies that have become the leaders of their respective category. Um, in the 2001 recession, the company that really came out of, of that recession was PayPal and obviously incredible, massive company um, hitting its, its uh, all time highs right now. Um, as, as the move toward contactless payments grows. Then in 2008, we saw the tremendous evolution of the payments landscape. And so from that, we had um, Audion, we had Stripe, we had Square, right? I think Square is um, an incredible company in terms of how it transformed commerce for small businesses. And then we had all of the lending companies, um, Cabbage, right? All the, the, as well as the, the personal lending companies. So the thing that I think about uh, is what, what's that next gen? So what, um, and of course, on the infrastructure side, we had Plaid, which enabled, right, all, all mm -hmm. of these different um, companies and late enabled consumers to share their data. Um, so for this next wave to come out of 2020, um, I, I think about sort of three big areas uh, where we will see great companies born. The first one, and it already started, is insurance. So InsurTech is one of the oldest and slowest areas of fintech where, where really it has not had any kind of meaningful innovation until 2017. So about three, three years old, right? And if you look at the incumbents, every area of the world, like you know, the US, there are at least uh, 10 massive companies with market cap, average market caps of about 20 billion. So, and then, and then same for Asia, same for Europe. So um, large, very large incumbents. Some startups uh, started to emerge in 2016, but really this is the year, 2020, that you see InsurTech start to take off. And the uh, and obviously uh, 2019, there, there were a few important acquisitions in InsurTech. And the areas that I think in insurance are the most interesting um, are home insurance. So um, obviously we are investors in a company called Hippo, um, Hippo Insurance. And Hippo has gone through, Hippo has literally had 
was some of its biggest days ever in, in March and April. And the reason for that is people are home. People have more time to shop around. People want to save money, right? And so Hippo's average policy is 25% less expensive than traditional policies. And uh, it's, it's modernized for the current home. So you get coverage for your iPhone and you get coverage for your, um, you know, your MacBook. That's, those things are not automatically included in, in traditional policies. So um, that's, I think that's a huge growth wave. Um, we see a company called Lemonade, which is renter's insurance, has filed to go public. And so I, I personally predict uh, 2020 through 2022, you're going to see a, a, a significant boom in the insurance ecosystem, uh, InsurTech in particular for consumer and SMBs. And so, you know, to the extent that we have more time, we can talk about what's driving that. Uh, but their insurance is really changing from a model of pooled risk to the ability to use data to price risk very precisely. So for example, for a home, if you have a very, your home is very new and you are close to the nearest fire hydrant. Um, so, you know, in the event of a fire, it'll be quick to, to get to you and you have monitoring in your home for water damage. Water damage is one of the number one reason for homeowners claims. You should have better pricing than somebody that um, is further away and you know doesn't has an old roof and mm -hmm. isn't managing you know monitoring for water damage so those are some of the things that i think are, are really really exciting in where insurance is going um we also have a company uh, called coalition which is cyber insurance for small businesses uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately cyber attacks on all businesses have increased dramatically during COVID, and what coalition does is it actually scans and identifies the gaps in every small business before it issues the policy. Uh, mm -hmm. And that company is also doing, doing incredibly well. So e everything about the insurance models from pricing to data sources, the, to monitor risk, the, are transforming. And I, I, I think mm, this is a really super, yeah, really, really exciting area. So that's one. The other big one um, is uh, aging population. This one is kind of at the intersection of health and insurance and fintech. So we, people are living longer. Uh, we have um, a, a, the number of people that are um, over 65, uh, is, uh, is increasing as a percent of the population. From a wealth transfer standpoint, we're going to have the largest wealth transfer in history over the next 30 years. And we actually have not had a lot of innovation in, in these areas. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that the, the COVID is forcing companies to think more and entrepreneurs to think more about people being at home and how do you offer them the services that I think will feed right in to this aging population? So mm -hmm. how do you offer at-home care, mm -hmm. uh, long-term care uh, with models that are, you know, with really incredible professionals? One of our companies is a company called Trusted Health, which is a marketplace for travel nurses. How do you mm -hmm. take some of those models and apply that now to long-term mm -hmm. care? right? How do you think about um, wealth transfer and real estate? Um, you know, are there models where um, younger consumers, younger members of the family can start to um, own a share of the real estate and the home while the parents are still alive? And then, of course, uh, just basic investing products um, and, and, and wealth, wealth management. There's been tremendous growth in um, will planning and trust mm -hmm. management uh, platforms with companies like Free Will. Um, all of these areas are, are exploding. So I think this is going to be a really big area to, to come out of COVID as the second one. And then my third one is um, where I'm looking and spending a lot of time is the gig economy and the deskless mm -hmm. workers. 
So um, how do you offer better, smarter, tech-driven products for uh, hmm. the in employees that are not working in the law firm and the, the consulting firm? They are either hourly workers and they need access and should get access to their paychecks earlier or all of the employees in the gig economy, right? So gig economy in the US today is 50 million workers. I certainly expect that number over um, this year in, in 2021 to increase dramatically. And so uh, for companies, uh, they, ha they have to deal with issues such as how do you track hours? Um, how do you track performance? How do you pay contractors? How do you pay consultants? How do you stay compliant with all of the different laws in, you know, for, for every single state? And oh my gosh, if some of them are um, overseas, how do you stay compliant with the laws of, of every country? And then for, for, the, um, for the gig workers, how do you get paid at a, in a reasonable amount of time? And how do you optimize cash flows? I think about some folks I know who are incredible designers. So design work, for example, is, they always are slammed in January and February because companies start off the year really hot on new product initiatives that mm. require design. But then they don't get paid oftentimes until March. So how do you better map, what, what are the platforms that can help map when uh, different sectors of gig economy workers, when they're getting paid, what's the consistency of how they're getting paid, how do you lend against that, and how do you help them smooth out their cash flows? Um, I think that those are all <laughs> super interesting areas where I, I'm looking for investments um, in those spaces. Yeah, it sounds like in the gig economy space, all of those folks need their own personal CFO. And, <laughs> it's, it's, and, yeah, literally, right? But that's that's the essence of what technology platforms should should offer to gig economy mm -hmm. work, right? In including optimizing your gig. You know, which yeah, um, if you if you take this job versus that job, what's what's going to be better for you? Yeah, um, there's a question that came in and. It's one I had on my list, so I'll just kind of go to it. I think it's from uh, Jason Vago. So J thanks, Jason, for asking this question. But uh, and it's a, a common question and very general, but it's important, I think. It, and, and the question is, in this environment, if you're out trying to raise money and you're a seed early stage company, do you have any like couple of like high level bullet point pieces of advice that you, you would give uh, to someone in that position? Yes. Um, I would have two big pieces of advice. The, fir the first one is uh, try to go further on your own while you're bootstrapped to prove out the seed concept um, so that you can actually, investors in, in the current time are looking for traction more than ever. And so um, try to demonstrate that traction. Even if you can't actually start selling the concept because you need the money to develop it, try to at least test the concept so that you can show and demonstrate what the interest would be. And there are different ways that you could test it. Could be depending on what the product is. If it's a consumer product, you could run Facebook ads and, and measure um, the kind of click-through and response rates that you get. If it's more of an enterprise product, you could do interviews with um, wh whoever your buyer is, you know, compliance officers or CISOs or CIO. I, I recently talked to a woman who was raising a round and she had done interviews with 100 CISOs that were incredibly comprehensive. I couldn't believe the amount of work that she did and um, because she had such clear insights about her market, about the gap, and about the customer. It was a mm -hmm. massively oversubscribed round and uh, uh, lots and lots of interest. So that's the first piece of advice. And then the second piece of advice is um, sit, look through your network to try to get a warm introduction. 
Um, we are doing deals through Zoom and more and more firms are, are doing deals through Zoom. I do think it is important and helpful to get an introduction through another founder um, that say, you know, uh, from your founder network that maybe has worked with Felicis. We have over 300 companies, right? And many of those companies, uh, they have a founding team of two, and then they have a leadership team of another five. So really think about for the VC firms that you're interested in, how do you get a warm introduction where the, the person introducing you can say, hey, you know, I've worked with Patrick and he is an incredibly, incredibly visionary CEO and these are his strengths. I, I think that that's super helpful. So those would be my two pieces of advice. Yeah, and so in this, uh, are you taking Zoom meetings then? You're meeting with founders? Oh, yeah. And, yeah, absolutely. Someone absolutely. wanted some, some validation on that in the question and answer section, so I wanted to make sure. Oh, let me 100%, ask, 100%, yeah. yeah. Let me ask another question that is, is kind of goes off that, because um, I get this a lot, and it, this is the, this concept of pitch decks. Um, you know, especially early stage, first time founders are trying to construct a pitch deck, right? That they can email around, it's going to get someone interested. And I get that question a lot, what should be in the pitch deck? I have my view because I've seen hundreds and hundreds of them. But I'm kind of curious, I guess, with two things. One, you know, from your perspective, is a pitch deck like um, super important in kind of your first contact with the idea? And then then what in that pitch deck do you think is the most important? And I know it will change from company to company and the, you know, the type of business they're pitching, but if there are, are there a few things that you know, an entrepreneur should be thinking about as they construct and send out that pitch deck to you? Very, very good question. Um, I am jotting down kind of the big three things that I, that I look for. Um, I do think they are important. I don't think that it, the, the format has to be a pitch deck. Some of the formats that I like and have seen have been memos, um, very comprehensive deal memos. One of the companies I looked at actually just last week had set up um, a, a super detailed overview in Notion and uh, I, I actually like that honestly better than a pitch deck because it was so crisp and concise and it answered every question. Um, and, then, and then the third is, you know, some, some founders do things, set up things like pipeline in, in a Google sheet. So big picture, I do think that prep is important. Um, I think it, it makes the meeting more effective both for you and for the investor. And when you go through, with, whether you use Notion or the Amazon style memo or pitch deck, it does force you to crystallize your thoughts mm -hmm. and to really express um, a couple of key aspects that are important when in investing in a business. And so what I think about as the most important things I look for are um, obviously this varies a little bit by stage, but I look for what, what is the macro story and do what, what is the critical need? I always ask, is this a nice have, nice to have, or is this a critical need? So what's changing in the macro environment, in the economy, um, in how companies buy, so paint, paint that picture, big mm -hmm. picture, and then how does that translate to why this service or product is a critical need? Um, so that's, that's the first thing I look for. The second one is moats. Um, what, what makes the, you especially well positioned to succeed in this sector? Uh, and the moats can be, you know, they don't have to be, start, they don't have to start off with technology, right? They could be the team, um, mm -hmm. inside knowledge, right? And later you build into the technology needs. Um, what is the overall landscape in the market? Um, are you doing something we look at is, are you, is this a reinvention market? So for example, are you reinventing Microsoft Office or is this a frontier market where you're creating a market that doesn't even exist today? 
And then what is your, what, what would the economics look like? What, you know, what, even if it's not built out, what do you think the unit economics will look like? And then what does the early pipeline look like for, for this product or concept? Let me ask a follow-up question. So the description you gave of those memos, the kind of longer form executive summary memos, why did you read them? Uh, and I ask that because I can imagine someone sending you like a 25 yeah. page report and you've got a lot, you got 48 million things in your inbox. That's it's a good question. So, yeah. So I'll take, I mean, I'll, um, without naming the name of the company, I'll say, I'll just say that it's in the remote space. So this is a okay. company that um, sent me um, a notion uh, document last week that I went through uh, very carefully. I read it because I am um, looking for uh, what the next, what is the next gen Zoom and what are some of the platforms that enable remote work. So this was a mm -hmm. platform company that enables remote work. So number one, it was a sector that I already cared about. Number two, I heard about the company and heard, knew a little bit about them from a seed investor. So they were raising an A. And so I had had a little bit of background Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't wait to dive into the, the notion document. It was really amazing. It was so well done. That's interesting. You know, yeah, I think David here, if I, if I can just jump yeah, in uh, and just mention, you know, another way, if you don't know someone who's a portfolio founder, uh, you know, the VC you're trying to get to, uh, if I just make, make a pitch, you know, uh, your legal advisor, <laughs> if you have the right <laughs> law firm, the partner uh, may have relationships in the business. So another reason that you right firm and another way to do it uh, as Jason's demonstrating here is asking questions at events uh, including through the Q&A here I actually can speak to that I, I got a hundred thousand dollars from Elon Musk by asking a question of him at a Pano monthly event <laughs> and so uh, if you ask a Q&A question here I can't promise Victoria will will be interested in getting your email later but you'll <laughs> you'll, you'll get on our radar screen at least so we're running out of time we don't have much more time but submit your questions uh, if you haven't already, and, and uh, Patrick, you're doing a great job of, of moderating them here. I'll let you continue doing that, but we're going to throw off uh, Lance, okay. uh, you know, did, did ask again, uh, yeah. what's the best way to approach seed investors these days? And, uh, and any other thoughts you have uh, beyond what you said, Victoria? Yeah, you know, I, I'll so follow that Lance's question about yeah. seed investors. Um, I often tell folks who are trying to raise money, right, that they need to find the right VC for them. You know, people, and like you just described, Victoria, you were interested in that subject matter already. Yeah. And, and I think there's, there's a lot that goes for uh, just doing your research for, uh, if you're an entrepreneur and trying to raise money, finding the right people who have domain interest mm -hmm. and then also domain expertise in what you're doing. There's a million people in the VC, not a million, but there's a lot of VCs. <laughs> and, and if you just blank it out your pitch deck, uh, you, know, you might not find the right people. So doing that research, uh, I think is, is, is really key. And uh, as you pointed out, having warm introductions, kind of finding the right people, um, and then uh, finding the right moment in time, that kind of triangulation is, is uh, uh, super helpful. Uh, there's a question here from Diane Carnes about the value of a demo versus a pitch deck. And this is a good question because I do get startup companies who are asking me, hey, I've got 25 grand. I have an app idea. Should I be what should I do with my money? Should I actually build wireframe? Should I hire a developer in you know, uh, Bulgaria to, to put together a, a working model? And I'm curious to, to know your thoughts. And I, I know the answer might, might, might depend on what, what the business is and what the company is kind of trying to do. But what are your thoughts about demos and expending early stage seed, seed money to build prototypes and minimum viable product uh, you know, type of applications? You know, very, very uh, sector dependent. We, we invest quite a bit in security, um, in physical security, cyber security. So for most enterprise uh, products, that's not going to be a great idea. I would say that if it's um, a consumer uh, app or potentially SMB, and it is something where you can actually demonstrate the value of what you're trying to do with that amount of money. And even better, you can possibly get it into the app store and start to get some early users, then by all means, that, that, that's a, a phenomenal idea. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see. Are there any other good questions, David? Are, are you reading? You know, maybe I can ask you a question, Patrick. Uh, that I have. I mean, you're you're close to founders right now. What are you seeing? Uh, you know, are are folks succeeding and closing a lot of deals right now, or is it really already those who uh, you know have already had meetings that started before the pandemic who are doing it? Yeah. I mean, what's what's your read of the market? Well, on balance, I think it's the latter. So I, I think uh, folks who had things already uh, had relationships developed and term sheets in hand. Uh, there was maybe six, eight, ten weeks ago, there was a lot of activity to try to wrap those things up. Um, and, and I think in the past, you know, month and a half, those have quieted down a bit. And I think a lot of people are trying to get their bearings. So my general advice is very similar to Victoria's right now that. Uh, this is a good time to, to hone your pitch, a good time to get your business plan um, in the best shape. If you can go get data uh, around your idea to show traction, to show, you know, whatever that kind of market is that you're trying to address, find things that, that you can have kind of evidence of why your, your idea will work. This is a good time to develop it. Uh, and then I, I think we'll see a lot, um, uh, we'll get a lot of information about the VC market in the fall is, is kind of what I'm, I'm thinking. But I think it's interesting, and Victoria, you might respond to this, you know, the VC market is usually very quiet in July and August. A lot of people yeah. you know, jet off to Italy and Spain or wherever or aren't <laughs> even around. I'm sure you, you're, but, but this, this year is a little unknown. No one's really traveling. Um, so maybe people will be doing deals in July and August because we're all sitting at home and yeah. we can I, I, I mean, Who knows? I can't wait. You know, I shared with you um, some of the PWC data on that we I, we only have it through Q1. So I, I can't wait to see the Q2 data based on what I see happening in the market. I think Q2 picked up quite a bit in deal activity, um, in particular in May and June. The thing that, that I would look at is the fact that there, there was a huge amount of money raised in, um, you know, in, uh, in 2019 uh, in particular. And so it, VCs are interested in putting that money to work and, and the level of innovation continues to, to boom. It's been incredible to see how much teams are able to accomplish uh, working remotely. And so my, my personal prediction is that uh, barring a massive spike in COVID, um, which sends, you know, sends the economy into a tailspin, I, I actually think we will have an active July and August uh, and September. That's great, I love that optimism. I'm sure a lot of the people on this, uh, this call love that optimism as well. Uh, well, listen, I think, David, this was only going to run one hour. So um, is it time to wrap up? What, you're in charge. We're just of your, about your show. time here, indeed. Maybe I'll just give uh, each of you a quick chance uh, before we jump over to a little VIP reception we have for folks who are invited. Uh, you know, what's, what's your biggest piece of advice uh, in these turbulent times uh, that you've been sharing with your, your founders that you work with uh, that you maybe haven't gotten a chance to share yet, if you could just close us on, uh, on that note. You're asking us, Pat, Patrick and I? Yeah, yeah, each of you. Like uh, maybe any, any, any other big advice uh, for, for riding out the storm uh, for folks uh, on the call? Yeah, I would say, I would say two things. First of all, um, I'm not sure if I said this, but this stop thinking about uh, November, December is the end. Um, I, I strongly believe based on everything that I've read about vaccines and, and how long it will take to, uh, to immunize the, uh, the world that this is the new norm for a while. Get used to the new norm. It's like we had a massive reset. So that was March, April. And now this is, this is the new world. And then figure out how to go on the offense, right? So if you're just starting out, that's going to be harder. But if you're an A, B, C, D stage company, you have money in the bank, you're one of the sectors that's essential. It's a critical critical need sector. It's time to go on the offense and, and grow faster, potentially make acquisitions. We are seeing com our companies start to do that. I think you're going to see even more broadly um, among public companies, uh, a pickup in M&A activity in the second half of the year. So, um, you know, think, start thinking offense 
And then really take care of your teams uh, during this time. You know, one of a one of our founders, a um, company called Ontic in Austin, I, I just love this. They, first of all, they're doing um, a daily standup. It's a series A company. We, we led the A. They're doing a daily standup with the team as kind of a quick, because you, you don't see each other in the office, right? So quick check-in on how's everybody doing, both, you know, both personally and professionally. What's, what's going on in the past? We've had, you know, engineering teams always doing these stand-ups. They've gone to, you know, full company stand-up. And then I love this. A few weeks ago, they um, drove around the two founders, uh, Luke and um, Thomas, and dropped off care kits for all the employees around Austin. Um, they're also doing Friday happy hours. Everybody brings their favorite drinks and, and they talk about the day. I think it's super important to bring the human touch to the to working on Zoom so that your employees stay motivated and connected to you as leaders. Awesome. Yeah, I, don't, I don't have a lot to add to that other than, um, you know, I think the entrepreneurs are most successful, the ones that find ways to adapt, pivot, and kind of learn from their changing environment around them and take the data they get and analyze it and make changes to their business. So clearly the past, you know, three months have given us an unprecedented amount of change um, that no one was expecting. And so to the extent need, people need to step back and do some self-assessment, uh, either personally or on a business perspective, I think now is a good time to do it. And, you know, don't, um, you know, I've got some founders who I've kind of recommended, don't, you know, hesitate to take a few minutes and maybe take a step back and re reevaluate everything to make sure uh, you're taking into account the, the kind of new normal that Victoria has described. And I completely agree with that. Um, and that uh, you're positioned, um, you know, to, to kind of go forward in that, that is this environment because things are a little bit different than they were. Well, thank you very much indeed, Victoria and Patrick for guiding us to this new normal. And again, if you are a founder, if you are an executive tech company, uh, you know, do uh, look to the LA Piper to, to guide you through this new normal uh, and Patrick uh, in particular, I put the uh, link in the chat there to his bio. You can get in touch. He uh, uh, works with startups all across the sectors. And uh, of course, uh, there are so many other partners for DLA who are joining us in the, the, the program here today too. And again, thank you so much to Elizabeth. It's all you, the list there from the firm and everyone who made this event possible. Uh, and just deepest thanks, Victoria, for jumping in here, uh, you know, 24 hours notice. This is a fascinating discussion. Uh, Patrick, you were <laughs> yeah, thank a wonderful you so much. moderator. Thanks, and boys, uh, uh, best fun. wishes uh, to the whole Tech Fire community, to all of you. And we're going to jump over to a little Zoom meeting here for, for those who got that invite uh, right now. And I'll, I'll see you guys there and I'll see the rest of you at our next event. Uh, invites and details will be going out to everyone. So thank you so much. All the best. Hey, thank you, David, for, for setting this up. I know it's a lot of work on your part. So thanks. Thanks, everyone, for joining.